good morning or good afternoon, whatever time you will be accessing this recording. I trust that this finds you well. My name is Ted Wahome and I'm an MDiv student. I will be my, in my final year um, this coming September. And it's a great and a massive privilege for me to be sharing with you God's word today. I'm also one of the teaching pastors at Mamlaka Hill Chapel. Um, that's where I serve. I've been serving there for a couple of years now and I'm glad to do so. Let me begin with a small story. There are two men watching a group of antelopes cross a certain river. Uh, this was actually in Kenya. And one of them knew a little bit about antelopes. And so he began to describe to his other friend the types of antelopes. And so one crossed and he said, oh, that's a meru antelope. And another crossed, he said, that's a meru antelope. And he kept on saying that for about 15 or so antelopes. And the other friend turned to him and asked him, is there no other type of antelope? Uh, or how many types of antelopes are there? To which his friend said, oh, actually there are only two types of antelopes. There are meru antelopes and femero antelopes, by which he meant male and female. Well, that adds not much to this message, um, but at least would help us to start off. My topic today was the social life of the transformed, the social life of the transformed. And let me begin with a question. How is it that you would know that somebody is filled with the Spirit? How would you know that an individual or a church is filled with the Spirit? Is it through speaking in tongues? Or is it in receiving divine revelation? Having a direct line with God? Is it in an abundance of spiritual gifts? We could go on listing the number of ways in which uh, people sometimes identify somebody or a church or a community of faith that is filled with the Spirit. Now, this may certainly be true. In fact, it is the Spirit that gives gifts. It is the Spirit that enables people to speak in tongues. It is the Spirit who is known as the Spirit of Truth, who teaches us all truth. He is the anointing or the charisma in 1 John 2.27 and his ministry includes teaching. Every spiritual gift comes from the Spirit. So this is certainly true. But in a passage that I'd like us to talk about in the next few minutes, Paul in Galatians will say that how you know somebody is filled with the Spirit is not through some private mystical experience, but through private expressions of love. Not through private mystical experiences of the Spirit, but through pra 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 practical expressions of love. In fact, maybe another way to put it is if you really want to see someone filled with the Spirit, look at their social lives. Look at how they relate with their family members, with their family of faith. Look at how they relate with the world. And that's how you will know that they are filled with the Spirit. This truth has actually been taught in many other places. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talks a lot about love in that famous chapter that has been preached in many weddings. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And then verse 4, he will describe and say love is patient and kind. Love is, does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And it goes on and on enlisting the characteristics of love. But you see, 1 Corinthians 13 falls within a larger section, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, in which he is talking about spiritual gifts. This community of faith in Corinth had been greatly gifted with all kinds of spiritual gifts. But Paul's basic message in this section is that it is not just about exercising our spiritual gifts that demonstrates that we are full of the Spirit. It is practical relationships of love. So that he says, for instance, if I speak in the tongues of men, but I do not love, I am only a clanging symbol. 
In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, similarly, Paul says, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And then he goes on to describe what this kind of life of spirit-filledness looks like. He talks about the relationship between a husband and a wife. A husband lovingly sacrifices for his wife and his wife joyfully submits to her. He talks about the relationship between parents and children. Parents love and instruct their children while children obey and honor their parents. He talks about masters and their slaves. Masters take care and do not, in a sense, anger their servants, but they also love and respect their servants. And so we see this truth repeated over and over in the scriptures. Jesus said that the way people will know that they are his disciples is that they love one another in John chapter 13, verse 35. So as we look at the social life of the transformed, we realize that this is really the evidence that we are keeping in step with the Spirit, that we are walking with God, and that His Holy Spirit is influencing and governing our lives. And so the text that I'd like us to consider very briefly is Galatians chapter 5. We'll read from verse 25 to chapter 6, verse 10. Allow me to read it, and then we will proceed. I'm reading from the ESV version. Galatians 5, 25 through to 6, 10. It says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let no one, I beg your pardon, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season he will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is God's word. Allow me to pray briefly. Lord, those things that we do not know, teach us. Those things that we do not have, give us. Those things that we are not, make us. For your glory and our joy through Christ. Amen. I hope in this text we can very briefly see that Paul describes the social life of a transformed Christian. Then he spells out a danger that lacks as we seek to live this kind of life and lays for us a duty. He describes the social life, he spells the danger for us, and then lays a duty on us. First, look at how Paul describes the social life of the Christian. There are two main ways or two main spheres that Paul thinks about in describing how the Christian relates with others. And these two spheres are the church, and the world. How does a Christian relate with fellow believers and the world? And the first way that he, he or she relates with others is by carrying another's burdens. Look at chapter 6 verse 1. If anyone, brothers, is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Then verse 2 he says, bear one another's burdens. So Paul imagines a situation in which a Christian, a brother or a sister, is caught, is overtaken. The word there speaks of someone who is overtaken by sin. This is someone who is caught unawares. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Imagine that somebody is watching some YouTube videos and they see a small video, uh, perhaps, that says seven most interesting facts about sex. 
and they begin to look at that and you know usually those videos have something like number five will shock you and this person begins to look at that looks at another video and before long they're going to bad sites websites that they should not be going to or somebody is placing a bet in one of these many sports betting companies and before long they are overtaken with a gambling addiction or perhaps somebody is tolerating and propagating a rumor and before long they are overrun overtaken by habits of gossip and slander paul says that one of the ways christians relate with others is by bearing one another's burdens approaching that brother or sister who is erring and actually reaching out to them and confronting them with their sin do you see he says that you who are spiritual now by spiritual he doesn't mean that there is a special elite class of christians everything between verse chapter 5 verse 16 has to do with life in the spirit so a spiritual person is one who is keeping in step with the spirit somebody who is walking with the spirit influenced and governed by the spirit everything they do is being directed by the spirit and he says and lays a responsibility that you who are spiritual should restore such a brother or a sister it would apply in a spirit of gentleness now the word here for restore is a very interesting word back in those days it was used of how you would put or set back a joint that was out of place so imagine some someone who had an accident and perhaps had a dislo uh, dislodged um, shoulder that person was restored in their joint and it's not a simple process it's, it's a painful process and so paul understands that in trying to do this this is not easy right i don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to go and talk to someone perhaps a, a believer and talk to them about some sin that may have overtaken them and sometimes you know it it fractures friendships sometimes that person may get defensive it's not an easy process but this is how believers live with one another they bear one another's burdens they bear one another's spiritual burdens and so paul says that one of the ways we relate with others is through correction and rebuke in a spirit of gentleness and respect knowing that we too are easily and sometimes easily entangled by those same sins but there are many other ways in which we can bear the spiritual burdens of others we can meaningfully engage in a local church and fulfill the one another's in the new testament somebody has done a study and said that there are 52 one another's in the new testament love one another serve one another do not pass judgment on one another exhort and encourage one another be hospitable to one another honor and esteem one another admonish one another meet one another be generous to one another all these are ways in which we are bearing and carrying the spiritual burdens of others and this will issue in all kinds of discipleship relationships it will issue in all kinds of conversations throughout the week calling someone and encouraging them with with a verse a passage of scripture that you're reflecting on and sharing it with them for their encouragement especially in a season such as this one that is very difficult another way that we bear or carry each other's burdens is through healthy accountability relationships a friend of mine puts it this way it is giving others meddling rights it's giving others what he calls a hunting license. In other words, you give people permission to ask you difficult questions. The same friend to told me a story when he was in campus, actually in Bible school, uh, right here. And a friend of his called him with whom he had given personal meddling rights or this hunting license uh, at about 11 p.m. And he asked him, hey, how are you? What are you doing? Where are you? And this guy said, um, I mean, this lady's uh, room, I did not have an iron box. And so I, I went to iron my clothes there. To which the brother told him, um, brother, 
I want you to leave there immediately, all right? And I want you to go back to your room. And the following morning, he showed up at 6 a.m. at his place with an iron box and told him, now you have no excuse to be in that lady's room at 11 p.m., just the two of you. These are healthy accountability relationships. These are ways in which we carry each other's burdens. But I believe Paul also has in mind not only spiritual burdens, but material burdens. This COVID-19 pandemic has dealt many significant blows financially. It would mean taking care and giving generously to those who've lost their jobs, whose businesses are struggling. So perhaps even now you know a friend or a neighbor or a relative who is really struggling. Carry their burdens and give generously. Paul also says that in verse 6, let the one who taught, who is taught the word share all good things with one who teaches. Now, here he speaks about the relationship between believers and those who serve over them, their pastors. And he says, let the one who is taught share all good things with the one who teaches. He uses a very rich word. This word that is translated share is the Greek word koinonia or fellowship. It's a prominent word in the book of Philippians. Uh, sometimes translated partnership. And the idea there is that there's a partnership or a fellowship uh, between pastors and their congregations. I think by extension, it's also one way in which believers bear one another's burdens. You see, it is proper that those who have been taught, those who have been instructed, share their material goods with those who are doing spiritual good to them. Philippians 4.18, this is how Paul describes some of the gifts that were given to him from the Philippian church. He says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, and this is how he describes them, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And therefore, I'd like to encourage all of us to continue giving financially to your local churches in as far as God enables now, of course, we live in Kenya and the prosperity gospel is rife among us. And many people have been wounded, coerced, deceived by prosperity gospel preachers who basically, in a sense, sell God's gifts for money. And that is absolutely not what we are talking about. You see, giving ought to be planned, it ought to be cheerful, and it ought to be according to your ability. In all these ways, Paul is thinking about carrying each other's burdens. There's another way in which he describes this social life of the believer, and that is seeking good in the world. Look at verse 9 of Galatians 6. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Believers are called to be salt and light to the world. To be salt means that we, through godly influence, we, in a sense, reduce the moral decay. Through our godly influence, we stop society from becoming worse. And so we are salt in the earth. To be light means that through our good deeds, we demonstrate that there is a good God who lives within us through his spirit. And we are meant to demonstrate all kinds of good works to the world. How might we do that? We might do that through alleviating suffering in the world and especially eternal suffering. You see, friends, the highest good you can do to someone is spiritual good. The highest good you can do to someone is doing something that would benefit their souls and their eternity. So I would ask you and I, how are we doing in our evangelism? Are we actually sharing the good news to save people from eternal condemnation and give them an opportunity to have eternal life? But beyond that, we also need to alleviate physical suffering, temporal suffering. This means that we ought to give generously to those in need who might not be in the families of faith in which we find ourselves. Back in the 4th century, there was an emperor called Emperor Julian. And he commentated, or I beg your pardon, he commented on 
the generosity of Christians, which he noticed was being such a force in the world and causing many people to become Christians. And this is what he says. The charity of the Christians to strangers has done the most to advance their cause. For it is disgraceful that these Christians support their poor in addition to our own. Emperor Julian was so affected and moved by the generosity of Christians who not only took care of their own poor, but even the poor of the world. And because of that, Christianity was spreading in leaps and bounds. Therefore, we are to seek opportunities to do good, to give generously. Do you have a neighbor who doesn't know Christ, who doesn't have a meal? Share with them. We are to do good in the world by seeking justice and mercy in the world. We do not have time to talk about how God demonstrates love through justice and mercy to the oppressed, to the weak, to the needy, to the orphans, to the widows, to the immigrants. And we are to seek good in the world. We are to seek justice and mercy in the world. We are to speak for the oppressed, caring for what I call the biblical quartet, those who are oppressed, orphans, widows, immigrants, and the poor. Speaking out against injustices, police brutality, pursuing just laws. All these are ways in which we can seek good, seek justice and mercy in the world. John Wesley, the great man who was used uh, in the 17th century reformation, revival, I beg your pardon, said, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, to all the people you can, in all the ways you can, for you will not pass this way again. So just to give us a brief of where we've come from, we've said that how we know that we are being filled with the Spirit is in our practical relationships of, in the world. And Paul here in this text describes for us what this social life looks like. It is described, he describes it by carrying one another's burdens and seeking good in the world. That would all be too easy, right? I could end this someone here. But we all know that most of our relationships are marked with all kinds of strife. And so he speaks of a danger that lies not without, but within us. And so first, he's described the social life. Secondly, he speaks of the danger that sometimes prohibits us from living this kind of life. Chapter 5, verse 26, he says, Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, the word conceit here is a rich word. It literally translates empty of glory. In fact, the older translations, such as the KJV, called it vain glorious. And it means a perceived absence of honor and glory leading to a need to prove our worth to ourselves and to others. Let me repeat that. A perceived absence of honor and glory leading to a need to prove our worth to ourselves and to others. And this is characteristic of literally all of us. And this conceit manifests itself in especially two ways. Paul says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Provoking is the stance of someone who is sure of their superiority and looking down on someone who is perceived as weaker. Envying is the stance of someone who is conscious of their inferiority, looking at someone who is perceived to be above and therefore envying them. And these are ways in which we relate with others. But at the heart of both is comparing ourselves. Have you ever found yourself comparing yourself to someone else? Oh, I wish I was as smart as so-and-so. I wish I was as wealthy as so-and-so. I wish as I was, I was as light-skinned as so-and-so. This is characteristic of the human experience. For most of us, we really do have this absence of honor and glory. And that leads us to want to prove our worth to, to ourselves and to others. So Paul says, the answer is that we must live by the Spirit and keep in step 
with the Spirit. We must seek by the Spirit to pursue true humility. Somebody described humility. I thought this was a fantastic uh, description. He said that humility is not thinking more of yourself. That is the superiority complex. It is not thinking less of yourself. That is inferiority complex, which is equally a sin. It is thinking of yourself less. It is not being too self-conscious about ourselves. It is not being too self-conscious about who we are and how people will perceive us. And do you notice that Paul is doing something interesting here? In the first part, we've described how he describes the social life as being others-centered. Do you see then that the enemy is us becoming too self-centered instead of being others-centered? Therefore, to the extent that we deal with this need to find our approval from others, to the extent that we deal with this, what is called in the Bible, the fear of man, to that extent, will we be able to live this life of practical love and relationships to others? Let me conclude by sharing the last point, which is the duty that Paul lays upon every single one of us who is a Christian. We've described the social life Amongst believers, believers carry one another's burdens in all kinds of ways, both spiritual and material burdens. Believers seek good in the world, right? They seek justice and mercy. They seek to do as much good in the world as they can. We've talked about the danger that lies within, which is this conceit, this pride that lies within us. And the answer being to pursue humility. A gospel-shaped humility. Thirdly, the duty that Paul lays upon us. Verse 7, he says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, in chapter 5, Paul had used uh, had spoken about these two same things, the flesh and the spirit. And in chapter 5, he uses a military metaphor. In verse 17, he says, The desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, or they wage war against each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. I'm sure as a Christian, you've experienced um, wanting to do certain things which are good, but not being able to do it. Why? Because the old man, the sinful nature, still dwells within you. The flesh lies within you. And then there are times when you really do want to do good in this world. And those are the passions of the flesh, and those two are at war. He moves from a military metaphor to an agricultural metaphor here. He likens the flesh and the spirit as two fields. And he says, you are always sowing. And where you sow depends what you reap. If you sow mangoes, you reap mangoes. If you sow apples, you, you reap apples. This is the irrevocable principle of sowing and reaping. And if you and I sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption. But if we sow to the spirit, we will reap eternal life. So what does it mean to sow in the flesh? To sow in the flesh means to engage ourselves and to commit ourselves to things that allow the flesh to be dominant in our lives. We saw flesh when, remember in chapter 5, he speaks about all these things that are works of the flesh. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. All these social sins that Paul talks about in chapter 5 verse 20. Those, when we give ourselves, when we yield ourselves to those sins, we are sowing to the flesh. I don't know if you've ever talked to someone and they, you know, I, I think one of the things, for instance, that we like is, is really gossip and slander, right? Have you heard about so and so? Or you even present it as a prayer request. Please pray for brother so and so, pray for sister so and so. I heard, and then... The gossip begins or maybe it could be envy you're looking at others who seem more successful who seem like god is blessing them in every way and god is not blessing them and we are envious of them when we 
give ourselves on to these things, we are sowing to the flesh. And what happens is that it reaps corruption. The word corruption there speaks of disintegration. The imagery is one of decaying food. You see, sin always corrupts. Sin always leads to destruction. It leads to a disintegrated life. Or to use the words of Chinua Achebe, sin makes things fall apart. When you and I engage in enmity, in strife, in jealousy, in fits of anger, what it does is that it breaks relationships. It disintegrates relationships. However, if we sow to the Spirit, if we appropriate the means of grace, prayer, reading of the word, joining in community, practicing all the one another's that I spoke about earlier, if we sow in the Spirit, what it yields is eternal life, what it yields is character, love. Paul likens it in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit, love, patience, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the duty of every Christian. We are to sow in the Spirit. We are to crucify the flesh and we are to sow in the Spirit, appropriating the means of grace and doing everything we can to ensure that our relationships are marked by these characteristics. How do we do that on a daily basis? Where do we get the power to do so? Earlier I said that conceit or pride is really what stands at the center. And do you notice that conceit is basically us desiring approval with man? And the answer really is for us to realize that if you and I are a Christian, if we have put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, then it is knowing that God's approval has been set on us in Jesus Christ. You see, as long as we know that God has his approval on us, that the only pair of eyes in the universe that counts looks on us with love, so that those words that he said to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, those same words apply to you who is a believer. If I am truly gripped by the message of the gospel, seeing how, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me and loved me and served me. If I am truly gripped by the message of the gospel, then I can truly experience victory over all kinds of conceit. And I will be freed to seek good in the world and to love others practically. And so my question would be, are you deeply reflecting on the gospel? Are you deeply reflecting on what the message of the gospel is and how it affects your relationships? Or are you constantly seeking the approval of men, the approval of human beings, which is fleeting, which is passing, which is insatiable? But if you and I are a Christian, God loves you perfectly. So that there is nothing you can do to make, you God, God, to make God love you more. And there's nothing that you can do to make, you God, to make God love you less. So that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing that you can do to make God loving you less. This is the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that you and I are so loved beg your pardon, the message of the gospel is that you and I were so bad that God had to die in order to save us. But the message of the gospel is also that God loved us so much that he was glad to do it. You see, it is this message that Paul is speaking about in Galatians. And he says, don't use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but use that freedom to love and to serve others. May the Lord give us grace to live this kind of a social life. God bless you.